everybody for being here. It's a great pleasure to be able to speak about the, this topic to everyone. Uh, so I've been tasked with, uh, in the next 40, 45 minutes or so, uh, making sure that everyone in this room can diagnose any kind of hip problem that comes into their office. So um, we'll, we'll try our best to do that. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. And one way to kind of um, compartmentalize things is to use um, acronyms. So I know we've all gone through uh, as healthcare providers, med school, PA school, NP school, and we used a lot of acronyms through those. So I came up with one for some of the most common hip pathologies that you may uh, encounter, okay? And then that's <clears throat> something we call stairs. So you could just think about it. If you look at those stairs, it makes anyone's hip kind of hurt a little bit. Um, so uh, we'll go through each of these a little bit um, in detail about what the possible uh, causes are for um, for pain uh, and injury. <clears throat> uh, so when I see a patient who comes into the office uh, with hip pain, there's three main questions that I ask. Okay, when did it happen? Chronicity, mechanism, or how how was it injured? And then most importantly, location. Okay, where does it hurt you? So you have no idea what some people think is actually their their hip. All right, and then so within the first one, chronicity, uh, there's, it's usually grouped into two um, types, either an acute injury, which can happen in sports or in athletics, or a chronic injury, which is probably more common uh, uh, in the primary care model, okay? Um, and most of this is due to overuse injuries uh, or repetitive microtrauma to the hip as well as degenerative injuries. And a lot of patients come in and say, it just started hurting a few months ago. There was never a specific injury for it, okay? Mechanism, so um, it's usually either contact or non-contact, and more commonly, non-contact. Um, uh, sometimes it'll just be twisting. Sometimes the patients will have gone on a long run, and then it starts hurting afterwards. Um, but specific things can kind of hone in on what the diagnosis is, which we'll get into for that. And most importantly, uh, location of the tear. So I always ask the patients to try to use one finger to point to uh, exactly where it hurts them the most when it flares up. And, and sometimes it's hard to localize and there could be multiple points, but based on where the main source of the pain is, you can kind of hone in on what the diagnosis will be, okay? So if it's anterior pain, it, it'll usually be either impingement, arthritis, or a flexor injury. Lateral pain is usually trochanteric pathology, which can include snapping of the hip. And then posterior pain is, usually, is more commonly referred pain than actually uh, hip pain, okay? So uh, <clears throat> in terms of the anatomy of the hip, it's a ball in a socket joint, okay? So um, uh, uh, there's a ring of thick cartilage called a labrum that uh, encapsulates the joint uh, and helps uh, buffer and create a suction seal there. So these are all areas that can cause pathology that, that we'll talk about. So it's mainly um, a ball and socket shape. And then all around the joint, there's quite a few muscles that cross it. So I'm just gonna highlight this for your notes, which we'll refer back to. Um, but a couple of uh, main places uh, include uh, the gluteus on the trochanteric, the outside of the hip. So uh, right there. And then uh, the iliopsoas, which is one of the hip flexors on the inside of the hip there, okay. Uh, so we'll talk about each of this uh, in more detail. So we're going to go through our, our STAIRS acronym next. So first, we start with strains, which is probably uh, the most common thing that people will have. Okay, so S for strain, and strain means it's a muscle strain, not necessarily a cartilage injury or a ligament injury or anything like that. And this can occur in all ages, uh, from, from kids to adults. Uh, and usually when they strain a muscle, it's where the muscle turns into tendon. So it's not necessarily right where it, uh, the tendon connects to the bone, but just a little bit farther down from it where it's actually muscle belly going into tendon, okay? And the ones in the hip area that are most likely to get injured are the ones that cross two joints, which includes your hip and your knee. Uh, and those are the, um, these three muscles here. The rectus femoris, which is one of your uh, quadriceps muscles, and that's directly uh, anterior uh, on the front of the hip, okay? So that's probably one of the most common uh, muscles that gets strained. So that could be from a, a high flexion injury um, or uh, sometimes if it's contact, they can be pulled in a little bit of extension and cause st strain for that. 
Um, and then um, the sartorius also crosses the joint, uh, but that's usually will present with pain that's a little bit higher up above the hip area. Okay, so we'll kind of go through that on the exam part. And then the iliopsoas is kind of is a deep hip flexor muscle. So that comes from the pelvis and lower back and inserts to the lesser trochanter. So that one's, you can't really pal palpate it, but it, it will be kind of a deep anterior uh, pain. And sometimes when you have um, an iliopsoas strain, people can have a little bit of snapping in their hips. So they say, oh my, I start feeling my hip snapping and clicking and that could be injury due to that muscle. Okay, and then if they have pain posteriorly, that's usually from the proximal hamstring. So the hamstring attach all the way to the very uh, top of the posterior hip, right underneath the uh, gluteus maximus muscle. Okay. Uh, treatment for muscle strains is uh, non-operative. So <clears throat> the, um, the rice technique of rest, ice, compression, and then anti-inflammatories. And then uh, when the pain kind of calms down, we have them do some gentle range of motion exercises. You can also have them do some physical therapy to kind of um, uh, re-strengthen the muscle. Um, and usually for patients to get better from this, it could be anywhere from one week to, to three weeks. Sometimes for the really bad uh, injuries, it could be a little bit longer. But in general, I tell patients uh, with these injuries to, to rest, uh, ice the hip, and take anti-inflammatories for the next couple of weeks until, uh, and then start getting back to doing the regular activities on it, okay? So that's usually the most common and relatively benign injury, and it gets better on its own, okay? Um, another one that's very common is pathology of your trochanteric area. So this, uh, there's three main uh, sympt uh, syndromes that present with pain in this area, and the most common thing is all of the, the pain is lateral on the hips. So it's on the side of the hip, it's never in the groin or in the back, but just on the outside of the hip, right where that greater trochanter bone is, okay? Um, and to go through these in a little bit more uh, detail, trochanteric bursitis is more common in um, pe people that are middle aged to a little bit older. And it's a lot more common in females than males just due to the shape of the pelvis and, and the uh, greater trochanter. What happens is there's an area of, we call this a bursa, which is a fluid sac that kind of covers right over that bony area that helps lubricate it as things move around. Right on the outside of this is the IT band. Though. The IT band is a thick connective tissue that rubs on the side of the hip. Uh, so that can, over time, cause a lot of friction and cause inflammation of the bursa here. Um, and then that'll cause a lot of pain directly over that area, okay? Um, and this, this is relatively easy to pick up on exam. It's uh, pain with direct palpation right over the greater trochanter. To treat this, we use uh, rest, ice, of course, anti-inflammatories, and then also physical therapy to try to uh, loosen up the IT band because usually it's because it's a little too tight and rubbing on it. And then you can also do cortisone uh, injections. And this one, you don't need uh, an ultrasound necessarily to do or x-rays. You can palpate right over the area where it hurts and uh, you can inject uh, uh, right over it. I usually give them about 40 milligrams of Depametrol for that, mixed in about five to seven cc's of 1% uh, lidocaine or, or some kind of local anesthetic, okay? Now, if, uh, if this doesn't get better after repeated injections and conservative management, which happens in some people, we could do um, a, uh, arthroscop or endoscopic procedure to just clean up the inflammation for it, okay? But that's rel relatively uncommon because um, by the time I have to do something like that, uh, the patients really will have had years of uh, non-responsive uh, conservative treatment, okay? Um, something that's very closely related to that and sometimes used interchangeably is called IT band syndrome. Usually, uh, you'll have the diagnosis of IT band syndrome in the younger population before it becomes bursitis uh, in the older population. So the IT band um, is that tight connective tissue that uh, goes right over the greater trochanter. And when that t uh, tissue is really tight, we'll show, we'll show you guys this on the exam. If you put them, the patient on their side, the hip will just kind of stay flexed up here. You can't get the knee to touch the other knee because it's so tight and, and holding uh, that leg up. And when that IT band is really tight, it causes a lot of friction and it can cause pain. And in younger patients, 
it can cause uh, snapping of the hip. So anytime they flex the hip, you'll actually see the IT band roll over and uh, you'll actually see a visible pop for it, okay? And this is also very common in our active population, in our runners and our bikers. So people who are doing a lot of repetitive uh, flexion of the hip can, uh, with tight IT bands can really irritate this area, okay? Um, so for this, it's the mainstay of treatment is actually physical therapy. So a lot of foam rolling to really uh, get that area loose. And now they're doing more uh, myofascial decompression, which is cupping, which works very well for uh, IT band syndrome. Okay. And then also very few cases where I have to do this, but I have had people with really bad IT band syndrome where we just released it a little bit and, uh, uh, and lengthened that tendon a little bit for them endoscopically, and they do fine after that. Okay. Um, and, and the last and probably the, more, uh, the most worrisome injury that can come from the trochanteric area is the gluteus uh, in injury. So right underneath your IT band and then underneath your bursa is uh, your abductor muscles, which is your gluteus medius and your gluteus minimus muscle. The gluteus maximus is a big external rotator, but the ones that truly help abduct the hip are deep underneath that, and they insert right onto the greater trochanter. Okay, so you can have chronic trochanteric bursitis that just irritates that muscle tendon over time, and then you can get a degenerative tear. So this is just like if you get a degenerative rotator cuff tear. So people call the, the gluteus uh, medius and minimus the rotator cuff of the hip. Uh, so uh, in older patients with kind of chronic lateral sided pain, this is one thing you want to uh, uh, make sure you uh, uh, do not miss on the exam because people uh, can get uh, tears of this and then you treat them with injections, but they, if they have a lot of weakness, then uh, that's usually a sign that it's more than just a bursitis and that there could be actually a muscle tear. Uh, and this is, again, more common in females in a little bit older age group. Uh, and uh, weakness uh, is the most important thing. And we'll talk about the Trendelenburg sign, which is when they walk, their, their hip drops to the other side. So we'll focus a lot on that on the physical exam portion, okay? Uh, and if it's a small tear, you can treat it conservatively at first, but usually these tears, um, by the time by, you see it clinically, they usually need to be repaired surgically, okay? And we can do it uh, endoscopically with minimally invasive surgery nowadays. Um, and then here's a little bit uh, uh, touching on to that exam. So when I do uh, strength testing and abduction, you, you want to have the patient lie on their side, and then you want to have their legs straight, and then have them lift it straight up. If they have a tear in the uh, gluteus muscle, they won't be able to lift it up at all. Okay. And then the Trendelenburg sign, when, when you have them stand on one leg on the injured side, the pelvis will, will, will drop off to the other side. Okay. And that's because when you stand on one leg, you're contracting the abductors on that side to keep the pelvis level. So when this muscle is torn, then it just falls onto the other side. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk more about that in detail as well. Uh, this is an MRI of a gluteus medius tear. So if you're suspecting the gluteus medius tear, you won't see it on x-ray. If there's a lot of weakness on exam and a lot of pain, you should get an MRI of the hip. And you can see this is the right hip, which is healthy. Here's the trochanter. Here's the gluteus medius muscle. This is the minimus on the inside. And then they attach uh, right onto the trochanter. On the left hip here, you can see the minimus is still coming down, but the gluteus medius, all of this white signal is where it's torn off and it's kind of retracted up here, okay, instead of touching the bone all the way down there. Okay, and then um, that's where the injury is. And then this is where, uh, when we look at it uh, endoscopically, the patient's lying down, feet uh, this way, heads that way, facing the, the ceiling. So we're looking at the outside here. And then this is the tendon, that's the bone. And then this is where it's just lifted off from the bone. So. So these injuries can become pretty significant. Uh, it's, it's definitely uh, more rare than uh, just the run-of-the-mill trochanteric bursitis and IT band syndrome. But if the patient's really weak, it's something that you don't want to miss. Okay. And then we can repair it surgically. We, we put in a, an anchor in the bone, and then we, we pass a suture around and then tie the tendon down to the bone. Okay, uh, the A in the stair, so we went through S, uh, T, and then now we're on to A, uh, stands for a couple of things. In adults, it's gonna be arthritis, 
And we're not going to talk too much about this because Dr. Ward's going to uh, talk in a lot more detail about arthritis um, in, in his lectures coming up. But it's the most common uh, source of growing pain in the older populations, over 55. Okay, and osteoarthritis as a whole is much more common than inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis patients can present a little bit younger and they may have multiple joint pain, whereas osteoarthritis usually limit to that, so, that one side. Sometimes they'll have a uh, history of uh, multiple joints with osteoarthritis, like the other hip or the knees, uh, but it's, uh, it's usually, uh, for the most part, localized, okay? Uh, and this is also anterior pain, deep groin pain, and when they present clinically, you'll have a loss of range of motion, so because of the arthritis, uh, uh, there'll be some crepitus and decreased range of motion through that, uh, and then, um, an altered gait pattern, which we'll talk a little bit on the, uh, on the exam. And then really to diagnose it, uh, we use radiographs. So you wanna look for a space between the bones, and then when it's severe arthritis, it's bone on bone. Now, not every patient with arthritis is gonna be this bad by the time they present. It's gonna be, a, there's gonna be a spectrum, but um, uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, sometimes I've seen young patients with uh, quite a bit of arthritis, but and old patients with not much arthritis at all uh, on x-rays, but then uh, uh, accelerate and develop into it very quickly. So there's qu quite a bit of a spectrum on, on that. But usually if you find get the appropriate x-rays, it'll help you with the diagnosis. Uh, conservative treatment, we usually do physical therapy with strengthening of the core muscles and the gluteus muscles, which helps stabilize the hip. And then you can also get injections. The injections for the hip joint should usually be done under uh, uh, guidance, so either ultrasound or fluoroscopic guidance. It's very hard to get all the way into the hip joint just in the clinic without any, with, without any guidance. Trochanteric uh, injections, not a problem, but if you're thinking about doing an intraarticular injection, I almost, uh, I always have either, uh, either ask uh, Anthony uh, to do it with ultrasound or I send him to the uh, radiologist to do it under fluoroscopic guidance, okay? And of course, uh, Dr. Ward will talk more about uh, operative treatment with hip replacements. Okay, uh, this part for children. So children, very unlikely to have osteoarthritis. So for kids, the A for that part is, uh, stands for avulsions, okay? So avulsions occur in children, but much less commonly in adults. Avulsion is where the bone actually pulls off. Uh, there's a small fracture of the bone from where the tendon of that muscle attaches. And there's four main areas where this can happen in children, okay? There is the ASIS, which is where the sartorius attaches, the AIIS, the anterior superior and anterior inferior iliac spine, and then the ischial tuberosity is where the hamstrings attach in the back, and then the lesser trochanter is where the iliopsoas attaches. So uh, in children that are running, doing sports, playing, uh, or, or they can have some kind of traumatic injury, uh, usually the tendons in children are stronger than, than the bony attachment, than the bone itself in some cases. So that's why when you have an injury, they can actually pull the bone off instead of tearing the tendon. Whereas in adults, you're much more likely to either strain the muscle or tear the tendon, okay? Uh, the good news is even when children have this, we usually don't have to do any surgical treatment on it. it you can just give them some time to heal and they actually heal it very well. And this is what some of those uh, avulsions look like. So this one is of the ASIS. So right here you can see that bone that's pulled off. So that's the sartorius here. This is the AIIS, which is where the rectus comes in. And then down here is the lesser trochanter or iliopsoas. And what happens is over time, it just kind of, usually it'll form some callus and, and, and bridge the bone. So, so they might have x-rays that look a little bit abnormal if they had uh, an injury in their uh, childhood and they come in as adults. But usually that's not symptomatic. It doesn't, it's not even that much weaker um, at all. So we treat that conservatively. Okay. And then um, the next uh, diagnosis, uh, the I in terms of stairs, is, stands for impingement. So impingement is actually uh, is a femoral acetabular impingement, FAI, which is the most common name that we call this diagnosis. And this is something that's very common anywhere from uh, adolescence to middle age patients. Uh, and it's something I see very often in, in my clinic. Uh, what happens after 45 is that the 
impingement turns into arthritis. So you don't really see a lot of older patients with FAI because by that time, uh, it, it's progressed to arthritis. Okay, um, and this is usually more of a chronic injury. So they'll usually be active patients who are doing sports and various activities, and they'll complain of uh, anterior groin pain. Okay, um, and. What FAI is, is that the shape of the hip joint is a little bit abnormal. So the geometric shape is not perfectly concentric, so the ball does not fit very well inside of the socket. And this is um, just a normal, uh, a part of development. There's a couple of theories about why this happens, but it could be common in as much as 20 to 30% of the general population. Not everyone has symptoms from the abnormal shape, and they all, they, not everyone has impingement because they're not always putting the hip in those positions to cause it. The patients that usually have more symptoms are the more uh, athletic ones that are doing these high flexion type of movements. So there's two main forms. One is the pincer lesion, which means that the socket or the acetabulum is over covered. So the socket is too deep or there's a little extra bone spur on the socket that pushes down on the head. And the other one is called cam impingement, which means that the, the ball or the head of the femur is not shaped like a perfect sphere. So on this diagram, they've got a little extra bone spur here at the neck. So it's kind of, so what you basically have is, uh, we always describe to patients, you put a square peg inside of a round hole. So it doesn't fit very well, and those edges really kind of uh, uh, braid. And most, of, most people actually have a combination of both. Okay, it's, it's hardly a truly isolated to just one or the other. And what happens inside of the joint is that uh, normally you have this thick layer of labrum that kind of protects it and buffers the joint. Uh, so, so patients have this formation by the time their skeleton matures, so by the time they're age 16 to 18. But most people don't have symptoms from this until later on in their sometimes 20s or more likely 30s or 40s. And, Usually what you have, you have the labrum that kind of protects it and buffers that area so you don't feel the impingement. But then over time you can tear the labrum and this is usually more of a chronic uh, uh, injury but you could do it also acutely in some instances and more of the uh, high level athletes that'll happen. And when the labrum's torn, you really lose that protective uh, uh, layer for the hip. And then you really start feeling the impingement from the abnormal bony shape, okay? And then patients have uh, a lot of symptoms from that. So they, they'll come in complaining of a couple of things. So anterior pain in the groin, so right in the front, and then they'll make this C shape with their hand and try to put it around the hip because it's kind of hard to localize. It's in the front and then sometimes it goes around the back. So we call this the, uh, a C shaped band. Uh, and then uh, something they'll describe as worse with prolonged sitting and then also work, worse with uh, physical activities like walking, running, jumping, and squats where, where you flex the hip. And then one exam maneuver we do to check for this is called the Fader test, which is flexion, adduction, and then internal rotation. We'll talk a lot more about this on the exam part. Okay. Um, and then uh, to uh, diagnose it, we use radiographs and then also MRI to look at the uh, uh, cartilage and labral pathology. So on radiographs, you'll usually see an abnormal uh, spur on the, cam uh, on the femoral side or on the uh, acetabulum side. And radiologists are a lot more adept at picking this up now for the most part. And then they'll say there might be an osseous uh, um, abnormality that could be uh, associated with FAI, usually is what they'll say. And then uh, if you get an MRI, if they have a large uh, tear in their labrum, which is the structure right here, um, you can usually see um, a, a separation. We don't necessarily always need to get contrast with these. I, I stopped doing that because a lot of times you can really see it with the um, more high resolution uh, 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 MRIs nowadays. Okay. And uh, this is a, a disease of the, of the athletes. So if you really look at our high level athletes, uh, for example, NFL players, almost 90% of them, if you looked at all of their x-rays when they uh, were, were doing the NFL combine where they're, where they're getting their medical exams, almost 90% of the players had some sign of F FAI on their x-rays. And then uh, hockey players, based on the skating motion, are very likely to have that kind of uh, uh, lesion. And then also soccer players with repetitive running. So people have, have theorized that it, it may be something that has to do with uh, 
uh, high level youth sports because if you look at all of these people they've been playing sports all their life and they've been playing at a high level so there could be uh, an injury to the physis during skeletal maturation that caused the, sh the bone shape to be a little bit ab abnormal okay so that's something we're still doing a lot of active research on the, the thing about fai is that it's a very common cause of early arthritis in the hip so if, if you look at people that have end-stage arthritis under age of 50 Half of them are because of FAI. The other half are because of hip dysplasia. And a small percentage is because of major trauma or car accidents, stuff like that. But uh, this is something that is high risk for it. So that's why you see a lot of these professional athletes, when they retire in their 30s, get hip replacements very early on. Okay. How do we treat this? So first line of treatment is conservative treatment, uh, rest, uh, physical therapy to strengthen up the muscles. If you strengthen up your core muscles and as well as your gluteus muscles, it could uh, unload the joint a little bit and you can uh, help the patient uh, uh, avoid positions where impingement really becomes symptomatic. You can also do an intraarticular cortisone injection to help with the pain and calm, calm them down. Um, surgical treatment is becoming a more popular option, especially for the athletes who need to get back to sport. And uh, we do do arthroscopy to uh, repair the labral tears. And then osteochondroplasty means we're reshaping the bones. So the abnormal bone spurs and, and the geometric shape, we can actually shave that down arthroscopically. So we'll, we'll uh, use a camera and a couple of small incisions with our instruments to find uh, where the injury is. So for this patient, this is a young patient with a large cam lesion here. And then we can shave that down to recontour the concavity of the femoral neck uh, to make it uh, a little bit more normal. And then that way they don't have any uh, further impingement symptoms. And then here there's a pincer lesion right here. You see this bubble of bone right here. That's kind of pushing down on the femur. Uh, and then afterwards we take it out. It's, it looks a lot more plain there. And then here, this is a, us repairing a labrum. So we'll usually put some um, suture uh, anchors inside of the bone, and then we can uh, loop that around the torn labrum, which is the structure. Here's the femoral head. Here's the acetabulum. This is the labrum that's all frayed and beat up. And then we'll basically uh, tie it down to uh, uh, repair the labrum back and, and uh, restore that functional seal for the hip. Okay. Um, outcomes for hip arthroscopy. So this is a surgery we've been doing uh, a lot more of in the last seven, ten years or so, and we're starting to get uh, better large-scale midterm and long-term outcomes. Two-year follow-up, pe people do very well from this, okay? And then uh, now we're starting to get five- and ten-year results, uh, which look promising uh, right now. So in terms of returning to sport, it does a great job at that. The main question is, does doing surgery for FAI prevent arthritis down the line? Because uh, right now, there's not any surgeries that are proven to prevent arthritis. Uh, but this is one case where, because of the mechanical nature of the cause of arthritis, where doing a, an arthroscopic procedure may actually help that. So we're actively doing some research. We're in the middle of a large trial at UCSF right now. And, and we've been recruiting patients uh, to look at this phenomenon. Okay. Um, okay, so that's uh, the I, so that's four out of the six things, okay? So R uh, is referred pain. So this is very common, okay? So um, you have to make sure when patients think they have hip pain, it actually is coming from the hip, which uh, a good percentage of the time, it, it definitely is not. So if you have pain that's kind of posterior for one and then coming upper back and any pain that radiates down the leg, past the knee is not coming from the hip. So sometimes hip pain can go down to the knee, but if it goes past the knee into the shin, into the foot, to the toes, that's definitely coming from the spine, okay? Um, and uh, referred pain uh, can most commonly be from a lumbar disc herniation. Sometimes they can have stenosis or, or degeneration of their disc space, um, but that usually presents with posterior pain. There's not a whole lot of true hip pathology that presents with posterior pain. Proximal hamstring injury is probably the most common thing. Otherwise, if it's kind of in the back, it's usually from the, back, uh, from the spine, okay? And again, lumbar radiculopathy, which is when you have compression on the nerve roots coming out uh, down the back, and that can cause numbness and tingling, which usually does not happen with, with hip pain uh, uh, itself, okay?
And then、uh, the other thing is knee pain can sometimes be from the hip joint. So a lot of times you'll see kids come in limping and they'll have pain in their knee, especially an, an overweight kid.、Um, then you you have to think this is a slip. Uh, femoral capital epiphysis. So a lot of times that's how they present.、Uh, and then if you get、uh, X-rays, you'll see that in the hip the physis has slipped.、Um, but for whatever reason, that's very commonly presenting with knee pain instead of hip pain. So so hip、uh, hip injuries can be referred down through the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve to the knee area. So if there's a patient that has chronic knee pain and you've done everything to work it up, the knee looks totally fine. Take an X-ray of the hip. Uh, there, there's a very good chance they might have some arthritis or something going on there. Okay. And then the last part of the S is stress fracture. So this uh, happens uh, in our athletes that are overtraining. Okay. So it can happen anywhere from a young, uh, uh, very dedicated、uh, athlete to、uh, our older patients, which is probably more on the osteoporotic spectrum. And stress fractures will present with pain in the groin as well as in the front of the thigh and in the joint. And this is worse with weight bearing. So for stress fractures, when they sit down, it feels better. But when they're walking and standing, it, it hurts more. Okay, versus impingement in this population, it, it actually hurts more with prolonged sitting. Okay, and then、uh, one test is a hop test. So you just have them stand on one leg and just hop up and down. If they have a stress fracture, that that's a very very、uh, difficult, a very painful exam. Um, more common in male,、uh, females and males, and then in females you'll always want to think about the athletic triad, which is stress fracture, amenorrhea, and then an eating disorder. So I've had quite a few、uh, uh, female athletes come in with these fractures, and we've taken a long time to counsel them through this,、uh, and, and it does turn out there, there's always a little bit of a combination of, of each. So you have to be on the lookout for for、uh, not just the athletic injury, but other things behind it. Okay. Uh, and then、uh, to fully diagnose a stress fracture, you won't necessarily see it on an X-ray. So you will see it on an MRI, and basically you'll just see a bright signal in the femur. It's not; it doesn't look like a normal fracture. It's not a crack all the way through the bone. But、uh, what it is is uh, 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 a loss of、um, uh, support in that one area that's been overworked, and then that'll show show up as a bright signal on your MRI, and it's very easily diagnosed by the radiologist. Uh, and I put these patients on crutches, so、uh, protected weight bearing, either non weight bearing or toe touch weight bearing for four to six weeks, and then I try to wean them off to see how how well it's healed. Okay, and then、uh, for sports, they're going to be off for at least three three months for for something like this, and sometimes closer to four、uh, four or five months. Okay. Okay, so to summarize. Uh, the main、uh, sources of、uh, hip pain you can kind of use as acronyms: stairs. So the first S is for strains, which is the most common thing. So hip flexor muscles, hamstring muscles,、uh, muscular strains. Okay. The next one is trochanteric pathology, and the main、uh, thing to remember for that is it's pain on the outside of the hip. So it's not groin pain, it's not pain in the back or anything like that. Outside, right over the greater trochanter. And you don't want to miss gluteus tear. So if they have a, not just pain but a lot of weakness, then you'll want to get an MRI to make sure the muscle hasn't torn. A is for arthritis in, a, in older adults, loss of range of motion, a lot of grinding,、uh, severe pain, and then、uh, avulsion in children where、uh, they can have an acute injury where、uh, the bone、uh, avulses off. And then in our kind of middle, younger to middle age population in the athletic patients,、uh, impingement. Or FAI, and then referred pain for for pain in the back of the hip and down the leg, and then stress fractures for our、uh, really kind of uh, uh, long distance, high endurance type of athletes. Okay.